Welcome, aloha. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. <laughs> Time for responsible change. <clears throat> Another difficult conversation to make good trouble about law and social justice and whatever these wonderful panelists have on their mind that they're willing to share with us today. <clears throat> and we've got Tina Patterson in Maryland, <clears throat> where things are probably a, a bit warm, <clears throat> but hopefully you're in a nice cool spot. <clears throat> mediator, arbitrator, business consultant, and experienced business professional. Ben Davis, <clears throat> adjunct professor at William and Lee. Or is it Washington and Lee? Washington and Lee. Okay. George, George Washington would insist, okay? Right. And <clears throat> Professor Emeritus from University of Toledo School of Law. And David Larson, immediate past chair of the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolution and Mitchell Hamlin, law school professor, a man who almost single-handedly brought online access to justice to the New York courts during the pandemic. So what a wonderful tool. Okay, folks, the battle between rights and privileges. <clears throat> On the one hand, <clears throat> person number one saying, I'm not giving up any of my privilege I don't care what you say your rights are. <clears throat> and on the other side, you've got person B saying, how can it be a right if it's not enforceable and if it doesn't protect what it's intended to? Where are we on that scale, rights versus privileges? Well, I think, I think, you know, historically in constitutional law, there's been something called the preferred position doctrine. And, and over time in different courts, not surprisingly, that preferred position doctrine has changed. And you look at the Warren Court and it looks like, well, maybe civil rights and equal treatment kinds of things were preferred. You look at this court, it looks like maybe religion and freedom of speech are being preferred over. Um, I think it's a, it's a, doctrine that's controversial and very much open to manipulation. And uh, I think it's susceptible to the criticism that it's the whatever the current court is, they can put whatever doctrine they believe by their own values as preferred, and then try and justify it under this, this supposed jurisprudential um, approach. Yeah, I would, uh, I, I would, I think, I, someone was talking to me about something similar but to this today, and they were referring to one of the Federalist Papers who said something about, you know, part of the role of the, of the government writ large, the courts, the legislature, and the uh, executive, right, is to mediate these things within a society. I have my stuff. I don't want you to have any stuff. I don't have any stuff. I want some stuff. Okay, well, we're not going to go around and start shooting up each other, right? The idea is, okay, well, what do we do? We elect people who are supposed to help us to see, well, do we take some stuff from this person and give it to that person as part of the greater good, you know, the public goods? Here's a classic one. What? Education. Let's take education, right? Uh, my kids are all, are all grown up now, right? So therefore, I have no interest in K through 12 schools. You know, well, I, I don't want to pay for that. Well, yeah, okay. But having an educated populace, the government could say, you know, we think we, you need to pay some taxes so we can pay for these schools for these kids, you know? And I'm like, that's part of what I got to do, you know? Um, I don't get to just hoard my money uh for the time that I have kids in school and then forget about everybody else. The other one I love is roads. There are lots of roads in America I will never travel on. Why should I pay taxes for those roads? I mean, there are roads everywhere in this country. I, there are probably roads all over Hawaii I will never ride on. Why should my federal taxes go to help with some, you know what I mean? It's like, well, you know, we kind of think that roads are good for everybody. You know what I mean? And so, uh, we don't want the Hawaiians to just have to pay for the roads in Hawaii, you know, because or the Utahns just for the roads in Utah, you know, we, or the Minneapolis, Minnesota folks just in Minnesota. We, you know, we, we, we pitch in, so to speak. 
And uh, you know, that's how I kind of think about it is that, okay, so what is the government doing to mediate, right? Is it doing things to mediate or is it not? Um, when there are these conflicts that are there, I don't know. That's sort of the, the, the paradigm I have in my head when I look at these things, you know. That's their job, you know, the government. That's their job to mediate our disputes. I mean, obviously, the local level, state and federal, there's different levels of mediation, right? But it, it's, you know, legislation or otherwise, it's to mediate those disputes in a way that meets the public good as defined, I know, in some way. <clears throat> So where are we on that scale between the government branches that are causing and amplifying conflict or government branches that are mitigating and resolving conflict? <laughs> Which end of the spectrum or where in, in the middle are we? Tina, thoughts? Sure. So none of the three branches are supporting uh, resolution of conflict. There's conflict within each of the branches and amongst the branches, which is unfortunate. Um, this is why we see organizations talking about term limits for the judiciary and wondering what's going to happen in the 2024 elections. We see candidates who are, are positioning themselves to run for, can, uh, for president in 2024 talking about the issue of rights, um, whether it is individual rights or privilege. And that privilege seems to be the prevailing conversation. And then those who are talking about rights attempting to be silenced or supporting rights. And I think David took a, a, I agree with what he said. It's tricky, it's controversial, and it's problematic because now we're talking about, I, I want to get married. I go into a facility and the person can determine it for any reason that they will not accept the fact that I'm getting married. Is it because it's my partner is of another race? Is it because I'm from another state? What are the reasons? And it, it's difficult. Um, and so I think all three branches, the ex executive branch is holding on by a thin thread. Um, and I, many of us would look to the executive branch to be the leaders, but we now see this conversation specifically about diversity, equity, inclusion, rights versus privilege, and it, it's all over the map. Um, so I think all three branches are really on a, on a slippery slope. Um, and, and watching closely to see who can really present itself or which branch can present itself as being rational and, and I hate to say it, thinking critically about the impact. What, what is unfolding here amongst the three branches is not just having an impact locally within our public policy, but also internationally. And I, I guess I say that because I've been watching the NATO public forum for the past couple of days and how this what's happening in the U.S. is playing out globally, even when we talk about things such as climate change. You have the executive branch taking one position, and then you have the legislative branch in a completely different state, and other regions are saying, um, what are you thinking about? What are you doing? So that's, that's a really valuable perspective. So who and what are the casualties of that slippery slope, of that tilted imbalance between rights and privileges, conflicts and solutions? I think, well, I think one, one of the casualties is a loss of trust and a loss of belief in government. And, you know, what's a consequence of that? Well, a consequence of that is that um, I'm going to have to take matters into my own hands. And um, we're seeing that, <laughs> a prime example, is um, January 6th, where people tried to take things into their own hands. But it's happening at, in all kinds of different ways, um, where people are, they don't trust the courts, and they're starting to engage in more kind of vigilante, independent justice in their own minds. And that's, that's frightening. Um, creates a lot of unpredictability. And in a situation where guns outnumber persons in our country, um, that's, that's very unsettling. Yeah, I, I wanted to jump on that point uh, David said about guns. I mean, that is cr crazy uh, in this country. Um, 
And, you know, I'm hearing a kind of view, which is that the right to have a gun uh, is means that in the United States, essentially, everybody we see in these mass murder, mass killings and all that stuff, that's like the price we pay. You know, it's like you're, how you have to pay your monthly insurance policy so you have the right to insurance. Well, it's like all these debts are the price we pay for the freedom that comes, so to speak, with the right to bear arms. And it's like almost a cost of doing business vision of having the right to bear arms in this country. I think it's very callous, but it's also a very, very disturbing aspect of of, of, of what's going on. And it's been going on, I guess, for a long time, but I find it really disturbing, the idea that we sort of get inured to what have been 300 mass shootings since the beginning of the year, you know? I mean, when you hear other countries talking back to what Tina was saying, what the world's looking at, you know? And they're looking at it and saying, you know, this is, in, what, what the heck is this, you know? And there's kind of an attitude of, oh, we're just, just the cost of doing business in the United States, you know, like, people get to have their guns. I mean, I saw this guy who uh, was eating a funnel cake on, uh, on uh, I think it was at uh, Atlantic City's beach. A seagull came along and tried to take his funnel cake. He pulls out his gun and he shoots the seagull. You know, I'm like, really? I mean, really? You're going to shoot a seagull? Because it tries to take your phone. Okay? I mean, it's a level of, uh, you know, it, it just seems insane to me, you know, but I, what do I, let alone shoot people, you know, let alone shoot people, you know. Uh, but that's a, the, we, we seem to be inured to it. Or uh, there's a beautiful speech that's done by a representative, I think, in uh, Iowa, I just saw, where she is criticizing the people voting the six-week uh, abortion ban. And, you know, it's basically abortion. saying, you know, she's saying things like, you know, if Jesus was feeding people, you would be knocking the leaves, loaves of bread out of their hands. You would be knocking the, 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 the water out of their hands if Jesus was feeding people. And you would say, well, why are you entitled to that? Why, you know, that, that, you know I mean, it was really talking about some of the sort of, hypocrisy of the voting that was there you know when there are these people that won't vote for health care for that mother you know things like that uh or or food or something like that and they were you know covering and wrapping themselves in christian and she went really far in a very frustrated way and basically calling out the hypocrisy of all these people who were sitting there trying to be so sanctimonious. And I think they were going to celebrate the signing of this in a church. And, you know, and she was like, how is this going to happen in a church? How are you going to, this vote that you're doing here, how are you going to celebrate it in a church when what's Christian about anything that you're doing? Ooh, I tell you, it was something. It was deep. It was deep. And, you know, those are the kind of things that, uh, I don't know, for me, it's just, those are the bizarre ones that uh, I, I don't have an answer to, but I find it very, very bizarre that it's where we're at in this country. Can uh, you ask who you... Go ahead. In. Uh, you asked who we, who we thought the, the victims were um, with, in this landscape. Uh, and so in the facilitation world, there's a, sometimes there's an exercise called flower power. And I'm going to say broadly that those who are the victims or who suffer based on what we're talking about are those who are considered not to be in power. People of color, those without education or formal, uh, the level of education that would help them navigate, um, whether it's a state, local, federal level, those who don't have access to those power brokers, people of color, the neurodivergent, people who are members of the LBGTQIA community, anyone who is not considered or perceived to be in power suffers. It would end up being along the spectrum of those who would suffer as a result of this conflict between privilege and, and power. 
I, I gave the example earlier of getting married. Um, we're, we're not just talking about interracial, but same sex. And then we talk about the neurodivergent for those who are not considered to be um, able to care for themselves or people of dis with people with disabilities, for the elderly, anyone who's not perceived to have power suffers, has the, it could suffer. I'm not going to say they are suffering, but could suffer. And access is, is, a, is an underlying factor here. Um, I think if you don't know who to go to or who to ask or who to, who to get the support from, it, it can mean the difference between accepting what's presented to you even though it's illegal and knowing that there's a course of action that you can take to either have your concern raised or to know that there's another option that's available to you. Well, and that calls to mind another spectrum here and in, in business and politics where decisions need to be made that affect multiple people or groups. Risk benefit analysis is generally considered to be one of the linchpin steps involved. <clears throat> but Ben raises a good point. When you weigh the risk of loss of hundreds and hundreds of lives versus whether you can have a loaded automatic assault weapon concealed or available to you in public, how does that pass risk benefit analysis? Are we getting to a point now where we're not balancing the interests anymore. It's just one against the other, and it's pure win lose zero sum. Absolutely, it's pure win lose zero sum. I win, you lose. Well, you know the the trickiness of risk benefit analysis is you have to assign values. Um, you know, so if you're gonna if you're gonna balance two things, you got to put a value on it. And um, Chuck, as you said earlier. Um, we have that we are in a position where, for God knows what reason, we have prioritized the value of having guns. And, um, you know, so, so since we have so much value on that, um, even though there might be something else that numerically is seems stunning, um, we've put so much value on gun ownership that, you know, I think history will condemn this 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 risk benefit analysis but we have not valued the human lives adequately um you know we've treated them like the like the seagull uh you know and you can shoot them when they come by it's, that's what you can do with human beings now and you know you mentioned 300 it's well over 300 now in terms yeah. of mass shootings it's just it's just soaring uh, but but so it's it's not that I think the problem is that not that we're not doing risk benefit analyses, is that you know we're not being critical enough about the values we're assigning to the two things we're balancing. Mm. I agree well, with Dave, and that's yeah. a cornerstone of doing a thorough risk benefit analysis. What what David is describing and what we're seeing is that there's a bias. There's there's already a a, a determination that some of the some of the risk or some of the factors in that analysis are 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 rated lower and ben i i'll pause because you were about to say well i was just thinking that i never hear of any mass shootings in hawaii uh and i was just thinking i mean maybe i'm wrong because i'm not local there but there must be something you're doing right in hawaii that allows that that we don't hear about of you know happening in the rest of the country. And I don't know exactly what it is, but it's something that struck me, you know? I don't know, is there, I mean, are there mass shootings in, in Hawaii, Chuck? You know, I don't know. Well, years and years ago, we had a Xerox mass shooting by an employee with some mental health problems and Tina's recent Think Tech episode on mental health and issues and concerns and the need to address them much more early and comprehensively is an important one. But the other thing is culturally, we have so many different groups and they're so mixed. Most people here 
are not of one single ethnicity or nationality or race or, or even color. My kids are Vietnamese American, my grandkids are Vietnamese American and Filipina and Hawaiian. And that's normal here. We have to get along because we are here and we are with each other. And so we have to either live with each other or get into the alternative, which is not attractive to us. And culturally, we have a fairly significant majority of Asian and Pacific Islander and indigenous people. And the cultural orientation there is uh, much more collaborative, cohesive, collective than it is individualistic, competitive, combative. So uh, all those things factor in, but how do we move those sliding scales? How do we reduce the harmful tilt in those imbalances? Yeah, one then posed a, uh, as a possible topic for today's discussion, uh, the school integration work. And, um, you know, school integration uh, is critical to social cohesion. I mean, that's how you create comfort between people who are different. It's, it's spending time with each other. And there's been lots of uh, psychological studies that have been done about the positive impact of school segregation, desegregation. And uh, if you have segregation, for instance, um, white children then see you know, they, they sense it, even if they don't, can't articulate it, that it's not democratic, that it is racist. Um, they, they feel that, even though they maybe can't articulate it, and they grow up with that. And so what can we do about it? It's, it's uh, I don't think we, I think we need to re remind ourselves that it wasn't that long ago that we had very advanced programs and Head Start, and we're working really hard on school um, integration that actually, when we can prove it with data, had very positive re results for um, uh, underrepresented and underinclusive populations. That test scores and achievement gaps closed, but we only did it for about 15 years, and then uh, then we kind of abandoned it. And uh, so I think one thing we can return to is recognizing, instead of condemning it as we recently have done in a recent. U.S. Supreme Court decision is recognizing some of the values of school integration that go way beyond the classroom and uh, change people for, for a lifetime. You know, and you raise a really cogent point here, which is Justice Powell in the majority decision or plurality decision in Bakke, the first major affirmative action enforcement case, has stressed not so much racial imbalance and rebalancing as the importance and value of diversity that universities, educational institutions, learning institutions have recognized that diversity has very large intrinsic value for the experience, its value, and its impact, both in the institution and outside in the larger community. And there was literally no mention of that in Justice Roberts' opinion or in the Supreme Court discussion, except in the dissent, of course, of Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. So, what does this mean for the value and importance of diversity, which has always been a central value? for this country in our last minute or two? Well, I, I just, uh, last night, was uh, listening to a speaker from a group called Do No Harm Medicine, who uh, is all about the crisis in medicine for, uh, of identity politics. And he, he's anti-wokeism, anti diversity, equity, inclusion, DEI, all this stuff. So I, I said, okay, he's here in Charlotte, but let me go see him, right? And I think you have to confront, and I'm going to say it with the word confront, 
the nonsense that is very well presented, okay? I mean, I ended up standing up in front of the guy and, you know, take in and trying to school him on the stuff. But, you know, it's very slickly done. A lot of things I, I notice are argued in terms of dichotomies. We have to, if we do this, we're going to lose that, you know, like that, that kind of thing. It's not like we can do, it's like everything's either or. So, but getting people to think in terms more of our old both and thing, you know, in other words, we can do uh, DEI over here and we can also do increased funding for education over here. You know, I mean, these things are not one or the other, you know, or uh, we, you know, we, I mean, it was literally, I mean, it was very bizarre listening to the guy because, uh, you know, he was, uh, it was all nonsense. I mean, it really was a lot of nonsense. And he's a doctor, okay? He's a doctor. So, you know, you're like doctor, you know, but you're like, doctor, this is nonsense, man. You know, I mean, I, and that's what I told him. Uh, and, uh, that, and I was in the room and, you know, there was somebody who was saying that the solution to everything is school choice, right? You know, and I'm like, really? I mean, really? School choice? You know, the evidence against school choice is massive, but this is like what people believe, right? I don't know. You know, I just, having to confront these things to the extent you can, wherever you're at. Not sure you yeah. can, but. Yeah, and I, again, I agree 100% with that. Um, one thing that that I find disturbing is that when I watch news broadcasts and they just yesterday were um, they showed Republican uh, congressional representatives. I'm going after the FBI director and and putting out insane accusations. <laughs> um, I mean, they're just re they were ridiculous. And you know, he was responding cr correctly. The crazy thing going now is that the Republicans are going after the FBI and every director of the FBI has always been a Republican. And the current one is a Republican. They're, they're going after, after the FBI. But um, if you see that on, on a news broadcast, on a 30 minute news broadcast, they just show the person asking the question and asserting inaccuracies. And then they go on to the next story. And there's no, there's no response. So if you're watching Matt Getz and and uh, a string of people throwing out unsupportable accusations. You just go on to the next story. There's people who are questioning whether or not that might be true. And the, the way that those stories are presented in our media without any kind of critical response, um, I think is really problematic. Okay, and in our last minute, Tina? Final thoughts? Keeping DEI and diversity at the center. Hey, is recalling the dignity. That, more equitably. Oh, absolutely. And it's recognizing that each and every one of us wants to be treated with dignity. It is, it's the cornerstone. Um, you know, the examples that both David and Ben have talked about, that person and it, this is not about race. This is not about ethnicity. This is about the core of who that person is being recognized as they truly are and, and recognizing what, what you're doing is harming this person. So can, can we go back to, I don't agree with you, but that doesn't mean I have to treat you with disrespect or in a way that's undignified. I think coming back to that will bring us back to upholding the, the diversity or recognizing the diversity that we so bravely and strongly fight for both here and abroad. And, you know, each, each, per and each, each person can be their individual and show their diverse thoughts and perspectives and way of life. It's about the dignity. What a great way to wrap us up. <laughs> Tina, Ben, David, thank you so much. Really valuable thoughts and insights. <laughs> And not just interest oriented, but value oriented. Maybe that's the centering balancing factor that we need to reground and recenter in. Thank you all so much. Think Tech Hawaii, thanks for joining us. 
We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Come back and see us. We welcome your thoughts, your questions, your insight. Take care and aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.